Uh, I'm in Sili from Sogang University. Uh, I was chosen as a moderator because I was a uh, uh, commissioner of Statics Korea for, from 2009 to 2011, which, which produced uh, population statistics. If, I, if you, a foreign uh, audience may excuse us, uh, because most of the audience is 99% uh, is uh, Korean. So, yeah, I will speak in Korean. 오늘 어, 사회를 맡은 서강대 이인실 교수인데요. 오늘 주제가 어, demographic crisis이고요. Impact of low birth rate and aging population on HRD입니다. 그리고 its policies. So, uh, uh, 이 moderator가 하는 가장 그 중요한 일 중에 하나가 어, 시간을 어떻게 manage 하느냐의 문제인데요. 어, 저는 그래서 음, 어, 근데 다행히도 이 세션이 음, 프레젠터가 한 분뿐이어서 좀 넉넉히 할수 있을 것 같고요. 아까 어, 소개해드린 대로 혹시 중간에 질문 있으시면 성함하고 어필리에이션을 같이 쓰셔서 어, 질문지를 저한테 주시면 제가 어, 대신 질문을 해드릴 거고요. 어, 오늘 발표해 주실 어, 스피커는 야스퍼 반 루르라고 유로피안 센터 포 디벨롭먼트 어, vocational training 이라는 그 우리나라의 크리백과 같은 그런 조직의 senior expert 로 계신 어, 분입니다. 어, 한 40분에서 45분 정도 어, 발표해 주시고요. 어, 그리고 나서 어, 두 분의 저희 디스 컨턴트가 있으신데요. 하나는 한 분은 유장수 부경대 교수님이고요. 다른 한 분은 어, 조대연 고려대 교수님이십니다. 아, 그럼 먼저 uh, thank you very much uh, to the moderator for the for the introduction and also for the um, for the invitation to speak at this important event. Um, I think it's not, um, uh, it's not really news to say that aging is one of the, of the mega trends uh, worldwide that impacts our societies. And it is a mega trend because it has important long-term impacts. It threatens the sustainability of pension and social security and health systems. Uh, in some countries, uh, especially in Europe, it's also accompanied by a shrinking population in the country or in particular regions. And it has wide-ranging impact on, on labor supply, labor demand, uh, trade, uh, savings and, and consumption, which means that new economic patterns and realities are emerging. Uh, now, some countries, especially in, in, in Europe, are more advanced than others in addressing aging challenges and started quite early. Uh, some of the countries in Northern Europe, for instance, Finland, was quite early in, in developing ex uh, effective responses to aging. Um, what I see if we look at, let's say, the developments over the last 20 to 30 years is that the perspective to aging in society has changed quite dramatically. Um, in the early years, people spoke about a demographic time bomb, uh, something that would really threaten us. Um, in the last few years, we talk about silver economies. That's quite a, a shift in thinking. Um, so in a way, part of the title of this session is, is crisis. Um, I think what we probably also need to look more into is the opportunities that, that aging actually brings. Of course, aging means more older people, and I'm, then I'm talking about maybe people over 80 or 85, but it also means that we have an aging workforce. And HR, uh, HR development, both as a science and as a profession, uh, has adapted in the last years and will continue to adapt itself 
in response. Uh, it does so in the context also of fast changing skill needs, changing jobs, and labor markets. Um, now the aging of the workforce is quite a multi-dimensional problem because it has implications for working conditions, occupational health, skill development and using skills, training and, and many other areas that HRD is concerned with, which makes that the responses to aging are actually quite complex and multi-dimensional. Today I will talk about aging in the European Union the responses to it, and attempt to draw some, some general conclusions. That is not so easy because the EU member states, the 28 countries that make up the European Union, are very diverse with different economic conditions and circumstances and also different policy frameworks. Um, but I will try to take the EU perspective and look for general patterns across countries and see what kind of lessons we can learn from that. This is an overview of the topics that I will discuss today. Um, I'll first give you a, a quick insight on SEDEFOP, which is the organization I represent. And after that, I'll cover roughly five topics. Aging and employment trends, policy responses, active aging, the challenges facing aging workers, and the lessons we can learn. I will use some empirical evidence to illustrate the main points. Um, so what is SEDEFOP and what do we do? Now, some of my colleagues in Greece, which is where we are based, um, have managed to explain uh, everything, or let's say almost everything, in a short video of, over, of just over two minutes. So I'd like to show you that video so you get a quick impression of what our work is about. The European Centre for the Development of Vocational Training, known as CEDEFOP from its French acronym, was established in 1975. It is the oldest of the 40 decentralised European Union agencies. Sedefop's first home was in West Berlin, West Germany. In 1995, Sedefop moved to the Saloniki in Greece. Sedefop's 120 staff come from all over the European Union. SEDEFOP examines the relationship between skills, qualifications and the labour market. It provides research, analysis and labour market intelligence to improve vocational education and training VET. SEDEFOP is involved in many initiatives to improve VET, including the New Skills Agenda for Europe. SEDEFOP monitors VET policy reform in EU member states and supports work-based learning through the European Alliance for Apprenticeships. It has helped develop European tools, such as the European Qualifications Framework and Europass, which make it easier to move across countries and different types of learning. SEDEFOP skill supply and demand forecasts provide insights into Europe's changing labour market. The agency manages Skills Panorama, the EU central access point for information on trends for skills and jobs across Europe. SEDEFOP is also a forum for sharing ideas and debating the best ways to improve VET. SEDEFOP will continue to promote learning for work to improve European citizens' job and career prospects. As you saw in this, in this video, learning for work is basically our motto, it's what we work on. And a lot of our work has actually in the last years focused on, on apprenticeships, on work-based learning. Uh, and vocational education and training policies um, to promote them. Uh, also in the context of the economic crisis, we know that in many European countries, youth unemployment 
surged was very high, with in some countries uh, rates over 40%, which is dramatic. And um, we, through our work, we, we support those countries in uh, improving their apprenticeship systems, um, allowing them to, to better re reply to the, to the economic uh, crisis. But of course, learning for work is, is broader. It's not only, let's say, initial education, the, the things that people do when they're young. It's also about learning at work during the career. And um, in the context of population aging, we've actually worked on that since, since, two, uh, since around 2000. Um, but only a couple of years later, we started to systematically collect, collect the evidence we have on population aging and what it actually means uh, for the workplace. Um, let's say around 2008, 2010, we've tried to collect the European evidence that we have uh, in a series, and you'll see, you'll see the series on the screen, of three books which cover about a thousand pages, a lot of intelligence there, um, about, let's say, the perspectives you can have to aging, but also what role guidance can play for aging workers. And one of the books goes more into, let's say, what are actually the benefits of investing in an older workforce. Um, the words you see there, this, this word cloud, is actually uh, the 100 most important words used in those books. And um, especially terms like organizational uh, change, acting, um, these are some of the key words that emerge as, let's say, also HRD concepts or terms uh, that are important, let's say, in the context of when you look at uh, aging and work. I would like to take you through some of the most important aging and employment trends in the European Union, both looking at what has, recent, what has recently happened and what is expected for, for the next, let's say, uh, 30 years or so. So this is a look at the, the most recent trends. And here we look at what happened since 2002. Um, if you look at the population age 55 to 64, actually their share in the, in the total population increased by about 2%, two percentage points, uh, from around 11 to about 13%. Their employment rate, so how many of these people actually uh, are employed, increased by about 15 percentage points. Um, now you see, you see that the line goes up just, just slightly, but if you look what this means in absolute terms, it's actually quite a big, a big shift because the employment in millions uh, went up from 20 million to, in 2002 to 35 million in 2015. This is a look at the future aging trends. And what I've done here is to compare Europe to other world regions. Uh, and this is based on the UN World Population Aging Report. And what you see here is the percentage of the population age 60 or over, which is on the horizontal axis. And the, the number of persons age 20 to 64 for every 65 year old on the vertical axis. Um, now the developments for Europe you see in the, in the green ellipse there in this um, circle. And um, what this shows is that compared to other world regions, Europe has, has actually progressed the most in terms of, uh, in terms of aging. Uh, what this means is that over the next 35 years, the share of people over 60 will increase by 10 percentage points. So while it's now around um, um, uh, let's say 20, 23, 24 percent, it will be close to 35 percent in 2050. And while now we have three and a half people, uh, let's say in the, in the age group 20 to 64, for every person age 65 or over, this ratio will decline to 1.9 by 2050. 
by 2050. So quite, quite significant trends, I think. I would now like to outline some of the policy responses to aging and work in the EU in the last decades, and especially focusing on how countries have gone, gone about dealing with aging workers in the past and how this has changed over time. Now, I think in order to understand, let's say, the development in aging, it's good to, to look back a little bit. And um, basically, um, here I look, let's say, what happened since, 19, since 1970. Actually, in the 1970s and 80s, the focus was very much on actually reducing the employment of aging people uh, because of mainly economic pressures. We had the oil crisis, we had the decline of some industries, we had increasing unemployment and growing numbers of younger people entering the labor market. This led to all kinds of measures to make it easier for people to, uh, to leave the labor market earlier. And uh, this is when uh, early and pre-retirement schemes actually came up and also uniform uh, pension ages were set. The idea was often that uh, if you let aging people leave the labor market, this would make space for young people that had trouble finding a job. Actually, this argument has been proven wrong uh, in, in much research, uh, let's say, in many countries around the world. Um, it's based on the argument that you have a fixed number of jobs and that you can distribute these between either young or, or old people. Um, but what is, if you look at the international evidence, what is actually clear is that um, countries where you have more older people active in the labor market, these are also the countries that have more younger people active in the labor market. Now from the 1990s onward, let's say more or less, it differs a bit uh, depending on what country you look at, we see that the response to aging uh, and work changes uh, quite significantly. Um, here we see demographic pressures. Uh, countries started to feel the rising cost of pensions. Uh, also in some cases, emerging labor market and, and skill shortages. And also the fact that aging became recognized as a, as a let's say, a future threat. This is also the times when the when the demographic time bomb idea came up that I mentioned earlier. This led to pension reform in many countries. Also better anti-discrimination legislation. So um, it became, uh, let's say, there were legal innovations to make sure that age discrimination was, uh, uh, was prevented. Um, new lifelong learning and employment uh, incentives and measures to, um, let's say, change the attitudes, the perceptions of age in society. Um, now, when I was preparing for this presentation, I tried to look at what this actually means. Let's say these policy measures over different time periods, what does that mean on, uh, in terms of employment rates? And, um, it was actually very hard or virtually impossible to find evidence for the EU as a whole because uh, uh, the EU now has, has many more countries than it used to have in the 70s. We have problems with definitions and things like that, so I won't go into detail there. Um, but I did manage to find a more or less consistent, let's say, data or time series for my home country, the Netherlands. Um, and this is where we look at let's say the developments, let's say from 1970 onwards. Um, now I actually found it quite surprising to see that um, in 1970, which is now 45 years ago, actually 80% of men were employed. Um, that's more than it is today. That's, um, you see that employment rate is declining over the years quite significantly. And in 1994, um, which is the year where the employment rate for men was the lowest, 
it was only 38%. So you see that um, um, the employment rate um, of aging workers, let's say, was cut in half. Um, this is what is also sometimes called the age employment paradox, because in the same period we see life expectancy increasing and employment rates go down. In the Netherlands, many people ended up in disability schemes. Uh, access to these schemes uh, became easier over the years. And this led to that in, that in 1990, over 14% 14 of the labor force was in these disability schemes, where it was like 5% in 1970. In 2014, um, the employment rate for men was, was back up to 67%. Uh, not yet back to, to where we started. Now for women, the pattern is a bit different. Um, starting at around 32% of women, let's say older women that were employed in 1970. In 1985, this dropped to a little over 10%. And the latest data, uh, which we show here, which is 2014, it was 43%. So this has increased quite significantly. We have to keep in mind that in the Netherlands, in that specific contract, uh, many women work part-time. So uh, this doesn't mean that, let's say, every person that is employed also has a, has a full-time job. Now, from 2000, and, uh, 2000 roughly onwards, in Europe and in many other countries around the world, we see a trend uh, towards seeing aging more holistically. And this is also the time when active aging comes up as a, as a, as a framework for policies in, in many countries. You see examples of this, let's say, in the in the overall EU policy development, but also in active aging strategies in, in member states. The pioneering work on active aging was do, done by the World Health Organization in the late 1990s. And uh, it produced a very important report, uh, which is called Active Aging and Policy Framework, around 2002. Now, active aging has three, let's say, legs. It's about participation, health, and security. Now, important is to point out that participation doesn't only mean labor market participation. It, it's actually much broader. It looks at, let's say, um, social participation, uh, participation in cultural activities, and a whole range of, um, um, let's say, activities that people can be involved in. Um, the roots of active aging are actually much older. Uh, it was a concept that already existed in the 1940s. But uh, in those days, it was, let's say, more about promoting uh, aging people to be active for personal life satisfaction. While uh, the more recent meaning of the, of the, of the active aging uh, development is, is much broader. I also try to see Let's see if we can see some trends of um, how important active aging has become. And just to get a general impression, uh, I used Google Scholar and I looked at, um, let's say, publications and reports and academic research and see how much active aging actually comes up. And here you can see that actually quite, it's quite a significant development. The, the picture is quite clear. Um, while in the early 1990s, there were just a few publications that looked at active aging. Um, in the last five years, this has risen to 16,000. Now, most publications on active aging actually look at health issues, but there are also a number of them that look, let's say, at employment uh, or HRD.
Now I'd like to move from, let's say, the concept or the, let's say, how this, this active aging concept emerged um, to what is actually happening in the European Union to make active aging a reality. And um, I think legislation and funding and, uh, instruments are some of the foundations. I'll come to more concrete policy measures later. Um, there's a number of EU-wide legislation, uh, let's say laws, which are kind of blanket laws that cover all the countries, um, that support active aging uh, in the European Union. And I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, for instance, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which includes, let's say, the provisions on age discrimination, uh, but also more general provisions in treaties that promote employment and uh, social inclusion, uh, objectives of promoting the working environment uh, to protect worker safety and health. Uh, also, which is very important for CEDEFOP is um, Article 166 of the Treaty of the EU, uh, which is on vocational training and labor market integration. And then you also have directives that um, are kind of instruments to make sure that, uh, that countries have legislation in place to ensure that the capacity of workers is taken into account when planning or organizing work, uh, and safety and health at work regulations. Now, many of these EU legislation principles also inform the development of active aging strategies at national level. Let me turn to funding activities. It's quite, uh, it's quite important, and I just mentioned a couple of, um, of the main funding instruments that exist at European level. Um, the European Structural Investment Funds, uh, you might have heard of uh, an important fund that is part of that, the European Social Fund, uh, which actually finances or co-funds a lot of activities that that promote active aging, for instance, by funding training for aging workers. Um, I'd also like to mention the Horizon 2020 initiative, which is, um, let's say, looking in uh, or promoting innovation uh, in the countries to deal with, with challenges. And for active aging, um, the theme that's very important is health demographic change and well-being. Uh, some other programs are, for instance, the Employment and Social Innovation Program and, and the Health Program, but these are smaller. I'll take you through a couple of the most important EU active aging policies and strategies uh, since 2000 on the way to 2020. 2020 has been let's say, the horizon uh, uh, in the last uh, years where much of the policies was focused on. There's also a number of targets that the EU set uh, to be achieved by 2020. Um, what is important, there was actually a quite, quite important initiative was the Lisbon strategy uh, the 2000 Lisbon strategy, which uh, included an employment target um, for the population, and shortly after also included an employment target for aging workers to be 50%. Um, some years later, in 2006, we had a quite important report on the demographic future of Europe, uh, from challenges to opportunities. And this report looked at how you can create more jobs, how you can increase working lives of better quality, and how you can make public finances and pension systems sustainable. Actually, in 2010, uh, there are a couple of initiatives, uh, European Council conclusions on active aging, which gave countries a number of priorities uh, to work on, actually 19. Also, the Europe 2020 strategy, 
uh, which set a 75% employment target and had a number of what we call flagship initiatives. Uh, some of the important flagship initiatives are new skills for new jobs. Um, let's say a general framework helping countries to, uh, to meet labor market and skill needs and to step up investment in education and training. But also, what happened here? Okay, doesn't matter. But also the innovation partnerships on active and healthy aging. Um, in 2011, uh, the Health for Growth program followed up by uh, a framework for occupational safety and health in 2014. And what is also important to mention, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, is the 2012 European Year for Active Aging and Solidarity Between Generations. Um, the most recent initiatives to, uh, which is very relevant to aging is the New Skills Agenda for Europe, uh, which was adopted this year. Uh, very relevant to an aging society because it improves the quality and the relevance of skills formation and also tries to make skills more visible and comparable. Um, this will help um, people develop more over their careers and also will promote that, let's say, the actual skills that people have are better used. Oh, they're back. I said I would come back quickly to the European year and uh, just as a bit of background, these European years have existed since 1983 and they always encourage debate and dialogue within and between countries. They are, so to say, awareness raising campaigns um, to, to educate European citizens, uh, attract the attention of national governments uh, to a particular issue to change attitudes and behaviors. And also they have the, uh, uh, the aim to, to influence policies. Now every year there's a particular theme and in 2012 it was, it was on active aging. Now what I present here is based on the evaluation of this European year and shows what kind of impact it has in a, in a, quite, in a nutshell. Um, first of all, the year was a year to develop new policies and tools. Uh, guiding principles for active aging in terms of employment, participation, and independent living. But also um, trying to measure active aging, to, to monitor it in the countries, to see what is actually happening. Um, also a number of countries uh, started adopting new strategies for active aging. Now, these new policies, these new tools, um, they were combined with strengthening the stakeholder involvement in three different ways. Um, increased awareness, more debate, and mutual, mutual learning between countries. And here you could see that, that this is involving many different stakeholders in the countries, employer organizations, uh, trade unions, civil society, regions, which are important players as well, and um, the media. Now, on the right, you see what we could see more or less as, as policy impact. Uh, and we see that in close to half of the countries, you see that, that stakeholders in the country say that the year itself led to new initiatives, uh, or it led to getting priorities um, or increasing priorities of active aging uh, in the country, new target groups of policies. And in some countries it also uh, stimulated cross-border uh, cross cooperation. So countries started to work together to look at the common problems they had to find, let's say, ways to cooperate to see um, uh, where, they could, where they could more move forward. 
to learn from each other. So I think the year on active aging, setting it very clearly on the agenda, did make a difference because it helped put aging as an important issue on policy agendas. Now what can we say about active aging in the countries that make up the EU? As I said in the previous slide, one of the achievements of the European year was development of monitoring, of actually seeing what is going on into the countries. And the Active Aging and Index is an instrument to see what countries are doing, in what state they're in, uh, in terms of active aging. And what it actually does is combining information on employment, participation in society, independent and secure living, and the capacity for active aging. A lot of statistical indicators go into this monitoring framework. And some of the outcomes um, are here. These are the data for 2014. Now, quite important differences between the countries. Uh, you see, for instance, a score of um, almost 45 in Sweden versus less than 30 in Greece. Northern EU countries tend to score better. Um, in the middle, you see kind of medium scores. And in the Eastern EU countries, the scores are somewhat lower. Now, part of the work on the Active Aging Index also showed, looked at correlations. Can, can we see what kind of impact this active aging has? And it suggests that active aging is beneficial for people and for the economy, because countries where the active aging index is higher, in those countries, uh, life satisfaction among older people is higher, and also GDP is higher. Can we say something about, let's say, progress over the last couple of years? You know, we can see from this, uh, this analysis that there has been some progress, but not on all of these four um, issues that go in. In terms of employment, the progress has not been that much, mainly because of the crisis. Participation in society, uh, we've seen some more programs, but over a period of four years, uh, we see small shifts. Um, I think it's also important to point out that even in countries that do quite well in terms of active aging, there's still considerable room for improvement. Uh, the highest country now has a score of 45, uh, while the maximum, let's say, if you have the perfect aging society, it would be somewhere around 57. Where you need the improvement um, also differs between countries. Some countries need to focus more on employment issues. Others need to focus on others. Um, what to say, uh, I mean, statistics have their limits. And, um, okay, they only give a general impression but this active aging index is a good example of how to use statistics, how to, how to make them come to life for policymakers uh, in designing or changing their active aging policies. It gives, and especially if you look at underlying dimensions, uh, it gives policymakers insights on what to work on. Now, from an HRD perspective, it is, of course, crucial to know um, what challenges aging workers face when it comes to learning and development, employment. Um, I will not talk about all those challenges. They are quite well known. But I'll try to focus on three that come from research that we've done over the last few years. And I'll try to illustrate a bit uh, what we found uh, with some facts. The first one is uh, about skills outdating. How fast do skills become out of date? Now, of course, we know that skills becoming out of date is a fact of life. Uh, what I also think is that um, it's quite difficult to quantify, um, mainly because it's very hard to disentangle, actually, um, 
you know, the part, let's say, this, the actual outdating of the skills and what people learn. Because if you try to measure skills that people have, it's always a combination of many different factors. Um, we tried to get an idea of how much skills outdating takes place in a small pilot survey that we did a couple of years ago by directly asking adult workers in four EU member states. Um, and we asked them what part of the skills they developed anywhere. And anywhere could be in school, it could be in work, it could be somewhere else. They now consider outdated. Now, the picture is that if you look at 100 people, um, 29 actually says none of my skills uh, have become out of date. 11 say that more than half of the skills uh, have become out of date. 23 uh, say it's between a quarter and a half, and the rest considers that up to a quarter of their skills uh, they have developed over time became outdated. Now, it's not necessarily a problem because skills outdating is also a sign of dynamic jobs uh, that help people actually learn. If you have enough workplace training, but maybe even more important, a learning environment uh, that, is, that is conducive to learning, new, um, uh, ensuring that people can update their skills, um, this is not necessarily a problem. I would say that people that say that um, there have been no, uh, none of their skills became outdated are probably people that face, face particular challenges because they are not, let's say, in a job that challenges them to develop over time. They're also more at risk. If something happens, if the company moves abroad, um, then they have very little, let's say, development over time that they can use to move somewhere else. So these people also face challenges. Then, of course, people that face a lot of skills outdating that don't get enough investment in skills um, might also face employability problems. The next slide comes from a survey that we've held in all the EU member states in 2014, which we call the European Skills and Jobs Survey. Now here we look for different generations at, uh, let's say, particular skills issues, and we look at undereducation and skill gaps for workers of different ages. Undereducation is when someone has a qualification, an education level, that is lower than they actually need for their, for their job. Skill gaps is when people miss uh, or say that they miss some important skills. Now what is interesting to, to see is that while skill gaps, they appear to be less common among older workers. Under education is, is much more of an issue for them. And here you see that 20%, one out of five uh, workers in the EU have the skills, but they don't have the education to show for it. They don't have the qualification to show for it. That makes it very important that next to training, we also look at skills validation, that people actually have a way to prove their skills. Uh, it's a very, very important element in, in, in active aging strategies. I would also like to show you uh, some evidence from Italy where we have some interesting data because Italian colleagues did a, did a survey among older workers. Um, and what this actually did was comparing the benefits uh, of training uh, with motivations. So they asked people uh, before they actually took part in training, what is your motivation to take part in training for different things? I mean, wage increases, uh, ensuring that um, I keep my job, uh, mobility. And what you see is that um, for all of these possible benefits of training, there's a large gap between what people see as a motivation to take part 
and what they actually see after they took the training, which means that workers do not always see the benefits. I think there's also an important role, um, especially for particular groups of workers, to ensure um, that they motivate, that they, they're motivated. Lessons to be learned. I think potentially there are many, but I would say that uh, the EU experience uh, that we've, let's say, seen over the, over the last decades points to three main lessons in terms of policy development. First of all, the importance of putting aging on the agenda. Uh, especially the European year, but also the, the tension uh, at EU level uh, over the years has managed to put stakeholders involved and has had some policy impact. Doesn't mean that implementation is, is, is where we would like it to be yet. Also the value of a policy framework and monitoring progress at country level. I think this could also be um, uh, mirrored at lower levels, for instance, at industries level or at company level. Uh, monitoring progress, demographic literacy tools for small and medium-sized enterprises, sectoral skills initiatives, um, they would show their value at, at, uh, at other levels. Um, I think also the EU experience showed the value of learning from each other. Countries have managed uh, in all kinds of forum to exchange experiences, um, to also avoid making the same mistakes again. Um, sometimes policy answers seem simple, but you, there are traps. Um, if you, I remember an example from my own country, if you have a training subsidy for all the workers, uh, what might happen if you put a particular age, you can say people over 40 get a training subsidy. What actually happened is that people that uh, uh, were just under 40 didn't get training. They just got the training a few years later. So it's not always so clear that uh, uh, what you have in mind works, works out. I would also like you just to show some, some overall statistical evidence where, um, which shows patterns across the EU, which also point towards some important lessons for human resource development. Um, the first one is that um, lifelong learning societies tend to be also more age inclusive. Um, what we see here is that countries where there's a lot of lifelong learning participation, um, those are also the countries where uh, the differences between aging workers and, and younger workers are much smaller. Uh, aging workers tend to participate more there. Um, this is a bit older evidence, but I think it, it's also good in, uh, um, in showing, because this shows that the barriers to take part in learning uh, are actually less important for older workers compared to their younger colleagues. Only health or age-related barriers are more important for older workers, but issues like conflict with work schedule or cost tend to be actually less important for older workers than it is for younger workers. This is about skills policies in general in the member states. Uh, and here we looked at um, validation, uh, making sure people can show for their skills, guidance, uh, recognition of qualifications uh, in an index. And we looked at how that impacts on activation. And activation means employment and labor market transitions. What you see is that countries that have invested a lot in strengthening their, their, their skill systems, their validation, their guidance, and practices, they have higher levels of labor market activation. This is the last statistical evidence, so I'm almost there. Um, 
I think this one is also important to show. Um, if you look at uh, the perceptions of age in society, the way people see age, and you compare that to innovation performance, you see actually quite uh, uh, a correlation there. And of course, this is only a correlation. We have to be careful in, 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 in drawing too much conclusions. But what it does show is that part of innovative societies is their ability to value people of all ages. Now, aging and I, HRD, where do we go from here? Um, this is, of course, a very difficult question. Uh, and I was thinking about what things um, would be uh, would be good to focus on. And I think, just if you think in very broad terms, uh, not going into all kinds of policies, measures, instruments, uh, uh, I think more or less the, mm, the principles we have in mind, um, the way we think, is probably the most, uh, the most important policy uh, idea. Um, of course, it's important to create and to keep doing that, create the possibilities and the conditions for HOR, HRD. Uh, strategies, incentives, age-friendly workplaces, making sure that there are no negative perception of age, these are all very important. Um, actually, the latest evidence that is just about to be published by one of our sister agencies shows that although countries have moved forward, uh, only in 10 of the EU countries, uh, we see truly an integrated holistic approach to aging. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Now the next phase, I would say that it's, it's about seeing aging truly as a strategic resource. Um, I mentioned already looking at the skills people have, uh, validating it, but also using it in jobs uh, is important. Matching jobs to people instead of matching people to jobs. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, an idea that, that could help in move things forward. Uh, more strategic partnerships, seeing HR as a profession uh, as a practice and as a science, more as a strategic partner with, with governments, for instance. I think the main idea is that it's not about what we should be doing for aging workers, but what aging workers can contribute to society. This is, uh, this is the, the idea. Now, I would like to end, as I started, uh, with a short video. And this is actually an example of how Poland is, uh, is approaching aging and what it's actually doing. And it's from um, an OECD review that I took part in a couple of years ago. What you show, see from this video is that um, you, see for, you see, let's say, the, uh, how, uh, how many dimensions aging had, what, what, what kind of issues it, it leads to, you see that the role of government, you also see the difference between different regions, and you see that local action can actually be a really good driver for change. So I'd like to start the video. Dane statystyczne wyraźnie pokazują, że rodzi się coraz mniej dzieci i przybywa osób starszych. Jest coraz więcej kobiet w społeczeństwie. Już dzisiaj na 100 mężczyzn przypada 107 kobiet. Ubywa osób po 25 roku życia, natomiast zwiększa się odsetek osób po 60. Uh, Poland is a big country. Uh, the regions and the different conditions, the proximity to cities, the metropolitan system in Poland uh, determines very much uh, the, the situation of uh, demographic change. We have at the same time uh, cities that are growing quite strongly, while all the regions are uh, shrinking strongly.
blisko centrum znajduje się na terenie Nowej Huty. Yeah. So Nowa obecnie ta dzielnica jest pod względem wieku najstarszą dzielnicą Krakowa. Na takiej małej powierzchni mamy i Centrum Kształcenia Ustawicznego, internaty kilku szkół zawodowych i mamy Centrum Kultury i Rekreacji Seniorów. I na przykład w ramach takiej współpracy młodzi ludzie uczą obsługi komputera starsze osoby. Taki przykład wydaje mi się, że on jest o tyle istotny, że on pokazuje powstanie instytucji, która próbuje wyjść naprzeciw tym zmianom, które powodują, że osoby starsze są przede wszystkim właśnie wykluczane z rynku pracy. O trzech zmianach bez wątpienia trzeba powiedzieć. Po pierwsze to jest y, zmniejszanie się liczby ludności. To co niepokoi to jest tempo, które zwłaszcza widać jest na terenie samego miasta Łodzi. I rodzi to bardzo znaczące konsekwencje dla przyszłości gospodarczej. Trzecią tendencją, o której trzeba wspomnieć, to jest starzenie się ludności. W momencie skończenia studiów bardzo, bardzo wiele osób się rozjechało w różne strony świata. Jest to olbrzymi problem dla tego miasta. Nie potrafi zatrzymać absolwentów. Jednym z podstawowych warunków przeciwdziałania tym niekorzystnym tendencjom jest między innymi zwiększenie miejsc pracy dostępnych młodym ludziom. Jesteśmy w siedzibie Spółdzielni Socjalnej FIGA. Jest to bistro, zaraz wracam. Spółdzielnia Socjalna jako część ekonomii społecznej ma rozmaite cele społeczne, nie tylko i wyłącznie gospodarcze. Może ją stworzyć co najmniej pięć osób które zaliczają się do grupy zagrożonej wykluczeniem społecznym. W naszym przypadku były to osoby bezrobotne. Jesteśmy jednym z nielicznych regionów w ogóle w Europie, w którym mamy dodatni przyrost naturalny i dodatnie saldo migracji, czyli zwiększa nam się liczba ludności, więc można by przypuszczać, że na razie nie jest to dla nas problem. Przecież ta potężna grupa w wieku produkcyjnym będzie teraz zasilać rok po roku tę grupę już w wieku poprodukcyjnym. To będą zupełnie inni emeryci i oni zażądają na tym rynku innej jakości życia. What's new about attitude towards market activity of 50 plus people is that it focuses on people who still work rather than on those who are already unemployed. So Krakow, which and then Dunsk, those are the three sort of different um, sort of trends that we are observing at the moment and all these cities are trying to face how, how to go about those uh, different sets of challenges. Bardzo często utożsamiamy problem zmian demograficznych z, z wyzwaniami dotyczącymi emerytur. Natomiast to jest również cała gama problemów na poziomie lokalnym związanych chociażby z dostępnością do różnych usług publicznych, usług społecznych, usług zdrowotnych, usług kulturalnych. These are complex problems. One cannot think of uh, bringing solutions to the problem of aging without thinking to the effect on youth. Wydłużenie okresu aktywności zawodowej, opóźnienie dezaktywizacji, czyli opóźnienie przechodzenia na, na emeryturę. Drugie wyzwanie to jest kwestia dzietności i myślenie o tym, co robić, żeby kobiety decydowały się na większą liczbę dzieci. Sometimes people have thought of demographic change as a time bomb. It's something that threatens us, but at the same time it's, uh, it brings with it many opportunities. The way ahead is to think about the solutions, the systemic approach that we need to demographic change now. We cannot delay the process. This is not possible. Uh, we need to, to start the process tomorrow. Yes, 
아주 훌륭한 발표를 잘 들었습니다. 특히 제가 관심이 있었던 것은 어, 한국적 상황과 비교해서 어, 유럽연합에 있어서 고령화 상황 그리고 그, 어, 그것과 연, 연결해서 어, employment trend 그리고 어, EU에 있어서의 어, 고령화 사회에 대한 여러 가지 정책적 리스판스 관련된 이런 부분에 대해서 대단히 흥미가 있었고요. 어, 지금 시험 관계상 이 어, 페이퍼에 대해서 제가 코멘트를 드리기보다는 어, 이 내용과 함께 이번 주제와 함께 어, 한국적 상황까지 고려해서 어, 핵심 내용을 중심으로 어, 저희 견해를 말씀드리는 걸로 대신하겠습니다. 어, 아시다시피 지금 출산율이 대단히 낮고 그리고 기대 수명은 또 상승하고 이런 상황에서 고령화 속도는 매우 빠른 속도로 진행이 되고 있습니다. 최근에 유엔 자료에 의하면 60세 이상 세계 인구에서 차지하는 60세 이상의 인구의 비중이 2000년에는 10%였습니다. 그런데 50년 뒤인 2050년에는 22%까지 증가할 것이다. 이렇게 큰 상승의 전망을 하고 있습니다. 아시다시피 한국에서의 고령화 속도는 세계 고령화 속도보다 훨씬 더 빠른 걸로 알려져 있습니다. 어, 여러분들 우리가 이 개념으로 썼을 때 어, 저출산율과 관련된 어, 중요한 개념이 합계출산율이라는 개념이 있습니다. Total Fertility Rate 관련된 이 부분이 1970년에는 4.53명이었습니다. 그래서 가입 여성이 출산할 수 있는 하나의 어, 포텐셜을 얘기해 주는 부분인데요. 숫자인데 이게 80년이 되면 2.82로 줄어듭니다. 그리고 어, 2014년에는 1.21, 1.21으로 떨어지고 있고 2040년 되면까지는 계속 그 수준을 유지하고 있습니다. 그래서 대단히 아, 합계 출산율이 낮게 되는 것을 볼 수가 있고요. 그리고 어, 오늘 우리 인실 전 통계청장님 또와 계십니다만 어, 통계청에서 발표한 어, 주, 한국에 있어서 출생자의 에버리지 리메이닝 라이프 타임입니다. 기대 여명, 평균적인 기대 여명이 70년에 출생한 어, 자의 기대 여명은 61.9년이었습니다. 그러나 2013년이 되면 81.8세로 됩니다. 그래서 어, 거의 어, 40년 사이에 20년이라는 수명의 연장이 일어납니다. 그래서 한편에서는 저출산, 한편에서는 고령화 이 부분이 결합된 것이 지금 한국뿐만 아니고 세계 전체의 인구 구조의 변화인데 한국에서는 그게 속도가 더 빠르다고 볼 수가 있습니다. 이런 저, 상당히 빠른 저출산과 고령화 속도가 노동시장에서 상당한 구조 변화를 만들어냅니다. 인구학적인 그런 변화가 노동시장의 큰 변화를 야기하고 있는데 단적으로 우리가 얘기하는 생산 가능 인구 15세에서 64세 인구 15세에서 64세 인구가 차지하는 비중 전체 인구 중에서 생산이 가능한 인구의 비중이 고령화로 인해서 떨어질 수밖에 없습니다. 그래서 이런 부분이 나타나고 있는데 특히 어. 그 65세 인구는 증가하고 생산 가능 인구는 줄어들고 이것이 노동시장에 큰 변화를 일으킬 수 있습니다. 어, 최근에 고용노동부 자료를 보면 은 2000년, 한 16년 전이죠. 2000년에 50세 이상의 노동력 비, 비중입니다. 노동시장에 참여하고 있는 50세 이상의 노동력 비중이 약 25%였습니다. 그런데 2050년에 오면 은 50%가 넘을 것으로 전망됩니다. 반면에 핵심 노동력인 25세에서 49세의 인구는 이 노동 참여하는 율 자체 이 전체 비중이 3분의 2로 떨어지는 그래서 노동력 인구에 있어서의 고령화도 나타나고 있습니다. 그래서 이런 부분이 인구 구조의 변화가 노동 시장의 구조의 변화를 야기할 수밖에 없는 그런 상황이고 여기에 따라서 사회의 많은 영역의 변화가 나타납니다. 뭐 결국 오늘 주제가 HRD 부분이기 때문에 HRD 부분에 대해서 좀 소점 맞추면 어 크게 보면 이렇게 이런 모양이죠. 어 생산력, 노동력 인구의 레이버 포스에 있어서 여러 가지 이 비중이 고령화되면서 HRD에 있어서 예전에는 
어, 이른바 학생들 중심 학교를 통한 인력에 초점 맞춘다든지 아니면 은 젊은 층 졸업을 하고 노동시장에 들어간 어, 초창기의 청년층을 대상으로 여러 가지 어, 스킬, 스킬 포메이션이라든지 업스킬링 이런 부분에 대해서 교육을 시키겠지만 이제는 비중 자체가 어, 고령화가 됨으로써 이, 이 핵심 노동층의 일, 그 인구가 점점 더 어, 상향이 됩니다. 그래서 이전에 HRD에서 주 타켓이 학생이나 청년들이었다면 예전이 중요합니다. 예전이 중요하지만 이전보다는 앞으로 현재 향후에는 이 핵심 노동력 중에서 이, 이, 지금보다는 좀 연세가 많으신 어, 재직 노동자에 대한 재직 근로자에 대한 어, HRD의 초점이 맞춰질 수밖에 없습니다. 그런 부분의 변화가 나타나고 어, 그리고 또 어, 또 한편에서는 과학기술이 대단히 빠른 속도로 발전을 하죠. 발전하기 때문에 어, 이, 이 부분에 관련해서 여러 가지 그 HRD에서 의 변화가 나타날 수밖에 없습니다. 이른바 어, 교육 컨텐츠의 변화가 나타나는 것이죠. 최근에 얘기하는 AI 그리고 이른바 제4차 산업혁명과 맞물려서 어, 특히 이 부분은 아무래도 이 학교 교육이라든지 청년층의 교육은 이 과학기술 혁명이라는 굉장히 빠른 속도로 이루어지고 있는 과학기술 혁명에 관련된 여기에 초점을 맞춰서 교육 콘텐츠가 그냥 상당히 이전과는 질적으로 다른 콘텐츠로 바뀌어야 될 것이고 또 한편에서는 중고령층에 대한 중고령층에 대한 HRD에 대한 인적 그리고 예산의 지원이 지금까지 보다는 훨씬 더 많이 이루어져야 된다고 생각을 합니다. 뭐 구체적인 숫자는 제가 생각을 하겠습니다만 그래서 몇 가지 이런 변화를 볼때 제가 몇 가지 좀 정리를 해드린다면 지금 말씀드렸듯이 HRD 정책의 주된 대상이 학생 혹은 청년에서 중장년층으로 이동을 해야 되고 물론 여전히 청년층에 대한 것은 중요합니다. 그리고 이게 이제 좌합이 노동시장에 들어가서 앞으로 노동시장에 들어가서 일할 수, 일을 할수 있고 해야 되는 이 기간이 길어지면서 직장 그리고 동시에 노동시장의 구조가 대단히 빠른 속도로 바뀌면서 우리가 평생 동안 해야 될 맡게 될 좌합의 수가 훨씬 더 늘어나는 것이죠. 좌합 수가 바뀌면 새로운 일을 맡게 되면 새로운 교육이 필요합니다. 그래서 여러 가지 면에서 이런 상황이 계속 교육에 관련된 컨티뉴스 트레이닝에 관련된 부분이 대한 요구가 대단히 많아집니다. 그래서 어, 이건 뭐 지금까지 말씀드린 그 부분을 정리한다면 어, 이, 그 고, HRD의 대상이 대상의 연령층이 높아지게 되고 그리고 높아지는 연령층에 대해서 한두 가지의 교육이 아니고 어, 이 조합이 바뀌면서 그게 맞춰서 어, 계속 컨티뉴스 트레이닝이 같이 가져야 되는 이런 식으로 HRD 정책이 전환되지 않으면 이 대단히 큰 문제를 일으키게 됩니다. 그래서 저는 이제 이런 부분이 인구 구조의 변화가 노동 시장의 변화를 야기시키고 노동 시장의 변화가 HRD 정책에서 변화를 야기시킬 때 시킬 때 정책적으로 보면 HRD 정책에 있어서 아주 중요한 저는 포인트가 이제 다음 정권이 뭐 얼마 뭐 어느 정권이 될지 모르겠습니다만은 다음 정부 구조 조정에서. 어, 구조적인 대단히 어렵, 어렵음에도 불구하고 HRD 관련 부서의 개편 부분 그리고 HRD 관련 부서의 개편과 동시에 그 역할 분담이 변화되지 않으면 지금 그리고 향후 바뀌는 이런 여러 가지 구조적인 저출산 고령화 사회에 대응하기 어렵다라는 생각이 듭니다. 그래서 지금 현재 교육부, 고용노동부, 그리고 보건복지부 특히 HRD는 앞에 두 부서이겠죠. <웃음> 이 부분에 대해서 이 준비를 해야 된다고 생각합니다. 이게 이제 정부 내에서는 하긴 어렵다 하더라도 연구자 속에 연구자들이 이런 저출산 고령화 사회에 맞는 노동 시장 변화에 맞는 HRD 정책을 체계적으로 수립할 수 있는 정부 부처의 변화가 생겨야 된다고 생각합니다. 그래서 이제 마지막으로 뭐 시간이 다된것 같습니다. 정리한다면 미래의 HRD 정책은 저출산과 고령화 시대로 인한 노동시장의 연령구조 변화를 반영을 해서 핵심 대상층의 변화, 
그리고 그 교육 훈련을 굉장히 체계화시켜야 되고 그리고 교육 내용을 혁신해야 됩니다. 그리고 HRD 정부 기관의 구조와 역할 변화를 포함하면서 어, 이런 어, 변화에 대응을 해야 된다고 생각합니다. 그래서 어, 오늘 이 자리가 우리가 뭐 제한된 시간입니다만 어, 그 이후에 있어서 여러 가지 어, 고령화의 변화들 그리고 거기에 대해서 어, 유럽현 유니언에 있어서 여러 가지 정책적 대안을 우리가 고려하면서 동시에 한국적 상황은 그보다 훨씬 더 훨씬 더 중요하면서 시급할 수도 있다라는 것을 말씀드리면서 이것이 기, 기, 어, 정부 부처의 변화와 동시에 컨텐츠의 변화까지 같이 가져야 되는, 되는 것이 매우 중요하다는 말씀을 드리면서 제 코멘트를 여기서 마치겠습니다. 대단히 감사합니다. 네 말씀하니까 생각나는데 한국은 아시다시피 절출산 고령화가 세계 유례 없이 빠르게 진행되고 있고요. 어, 10년 전부터 저출산 고령화 기본 계획을 어, 5년 단위로 실시해서 어, 10년을 마쳤고요. 그리고 이제 올해 3차 기본 계획이 시행 중인데 어, 상당량의 예산을 투입했음에도 불구하고 아까 방금 얘기하신 것처럼 저희의 그 합계 출산율이 1.3을 넘지를 못하고 있습니다. 어, 말씀하신 것처럼 HRD 정책에 대한 근본적 변화가 있지 않으면 쉽지 않겠다는 생각이 듭니다. 이번에는 HRD의 전문가이신 고려대 어, 조대원 교수님께서 어, H, 저, 그 관련해서 토론을 해주시겠습니다. 네, 고맙습니다. 그리고 우리 어, 야스퍼 벤루 선생님의 발표 잘 들었고요. 그다음에 우리 유장수 교수님 토론 또잘 들었습니다. 우선 뭐 어, 저출산에 대한 문제는 아까 이제 계속 어떤 수통계 수치로 어, 지금 말씀을 해주셨는데 저도 되게 인상적인 게 뭐냐면 지금 우리나라 그 인구를 고령자부터 어, 영세까지 나래비를 쭉 이렇게 한 줄을 세우면 그 중간치가 있잖아요. 지금 중간치가 어, 40.8세랍니다. 근데 그게 2060년이 되면 57.9세, 그러니까 거의 58세로 된다는 거예요. 중간치가. 근데 어, 그 세계 통계를 보면 2060년에 에, 세계 통계의 에, 그 중간치는 37.3세입니다. 그러니까 우리나라가 어, 외국에 비해서 다른 나라에 비해서 20년이 더 연로한 에, 그런 거죠. 그러니까 저출산 고령화에 대한 문제가 사실 큰 이슈이고요. 그리고 오늘 이 자리가 되게 의미 있는 게 뭐냐면 우리 에 보통은 이제 이런 정책에 대한 또는 HRD 정책에 대한 그 벤치마킹을 일본이나 미국이나 이런 쪽으로 하는데 오늘 이 세션에서는 거의 유럽의 전반적인 얘기를 들은 그 자체로도 우리는 되게 좋은 에 그런 기회였다는 말씀을 좀 드립니다. 자, 저출산 고령화가 가장 큰 이제 에 다가오는 문제가 이제 그 레이버 마켓, 그러니까 노동 시장의 어떤 공백이죠. 그러니까 노동 시장 공백을 메꾸기 위해서 우리는 이제 노력을 해야 되는데 그 노력 중에 하나가 일단은 저는 제가 생각하기에는 어 학령기에 대한 어떤 그 학제 개편도 하나의 어떤 이슈라고 봅니다. 왜냐면 우리가 초등학교, 중고등학교, 대학을 거의 우리나라 대학의 진학률이 이제 70% 정도 되거든요. 현재는 어 과거 한 4, 5년 전까지만 해도 82%였습니다. 그러니까 마이스터거나 어떤 실업계 고등학교에 대한 어, 특성화고다에 대한 어떤 정부 지원 정책 때문에 많이 이제 줄긴 했는데 여전 70% 이상을 차지한다고 보면 어, 많은 사람들이 대학을 가는 상황에서 어, 지금 거의 한 70년 이상의 학제를 그냥 유지하는 것이 과연 옳은가라는 문제도 한번 짚어볼 그런 시점이 됐다고 생각을 합니다. 그리고 어떤 직업 교육에 대한 내실화. 그래서 저는 지금 우리나라의 그 학제 중에서 전문 대학이 있잖아요. 그러니까 전문 대학이나 대학이나 이제 학생들이 선택을 하게 되는데 좀더 강하게 얘기하면 전문 대학도 하나의 초중고등학교처럼 하나의 거쳐가야 되는 그러니까 모든 사람 모든 학생들이 어떤 보케이셔널 스킬 또는 삶에 있어서의 어떤 직업적인 어떤 스킬이나 어떤 태도 이런 것을 함양해야 된다고 한다면 전문 대학도 전문 대학이냐 사진제 대학이냐를 초이스하는 것이 아니라 어, 전문 대학도 하나의 에, 초중고등학교처럼 어, 거쳐가는. 그래서 전문 대학을 마쳐서 직업 세계로 내려가 나가는 친구들이 있고 또 공부를 할 친구들만 대학으로 가는 그런 학제 개편도 한번 고려해 볼 만한 것이 아닌가라는 생각이 들고요. 또 하나는 이제 우리 그 여성에 대한 문제도 한번 생각해 볼 필요가 있습니다. 
여성에 대한 문제. 그러니까 특히 우리나라 여성들 같은 경우 지금 고등교육 진학률이 남자보다 여자가 높아요. 아까 이제 우리 통계치 우리 저기 유럽의 통계치를 보면 어그 중고령자의 통계치에서 어 남성보다 여성이 좀어 낮은 그런 취업률을 보이고 있는데 어 우리나라도 지금 똑같은 현상이고요. 근데 오히려 고학력은 여성들이 더어 많다는 거죠. 그래서 고학력들의 어떤 경력 단절 여성들의 괜찮은 일자리 창출 들을 좀 고려해 볼 필요가 있겠다. 물론 지금까지 하고 있습니다. 하고 있는데 지금 그 여성들의 그, 어, 그 경력단주 여성들을 위한 프로그램들 같은 경우는 그 프로그램들로 인해서 더욱더 경력단절이 야기가 돼요. 그러니까 괜찮은 일자리 창출을 위한 프로그램이 아니라 어떤 안 괜찮은 일자리 창출을 위한 프로그램들인 거예요. 지금까지. 그러니까 그게 계속 악순환처럼 어, 되고 있다는 것이 문제라고 볼수 있고요. 그리고 또 이제 중고령자에 대해서는 우리 에, 저 루선생님께서 말씀을 많이 하셨기 때문에 에, 우리나라도 똑같은 그런 어, 상황이고요. 그리고 또 이제 우리가 또 하나 어, 관심을 더해야 될 이슈가 뭐냐면 다문화, 그러니까 해외 근로자들 그리고 어, 이제 그 탈북민들에 대한 그런 이슈들을 우리 노동시장이 어떻게 이제 접목시켜서 그들을 좀 음, 한국 사회의 안정적인 어떤 정착뿐만 아니라 또 하나의 중추적인 노동 세력으로 노동력의 어떤 그런 일원으로 어, 자리 잡을 수 있도록 좀 정부 차원에서 노력을 할 필요가 있다라는 생각이 듭니다. 그래서 저는 우리 루 선생님께 한번 좀 여쭤보고 싶은 것 중에 하나가 그 오늘 발표 때는 이제 얘기 안 하셨는데 어, 그 발표문 홈페이지 에 올라간 발표문을 보면요 어, 에이지 매니지먼트라는 표현이 있어요. 에이지 매니지먼트. 그뭐 그러니까 그 우리가 옛날에 이제 한 10년 전에 15년 전에 시테크 타임 매니지먼트 뭐 이런 얘기 했었잖아요. 그 에이지 매니지먼트라는 건 저는 좀 생소한 그런 개념이에요. 그래서 유럽에서는 에이지 매니지먼트가 어떤 개념인지 좀 여쭤보고 싶고요. 또 하나는 이제 액티브 에이징 인덱스라고 해서 아까 그 나라의 나라별 그런 그 어, 통계 자료를 보여주셨는데 그 중에 네 가지를 말씀하셨는데 네 가지 중에 하나가 이제 캐퍼시티 포 액티브 에이징이라는 거였어요. 그런 개념이 뭔지 좀 구체적으로 설명을 좀 듣고 싶습니다. 네, 이상으로 어, 토론을 마치겠습니다. 고맙습니다. 예, 감사합니다. 아, 제가 플로어에서 그 질문을 질문지를 이미 받았어요. 그래서 제가 어, 일부 질문을 해드리고 나중에 일괄적으로 이렇게 답을 하시는 걸로 그렇게 하겠습니다. 어, 대한 전문 대학교 교육 협의회 주홍석 선생님께서 어, 고령 근로자가 어, 지금 늘고 있는 그런 상황인데. 지금 4차 산업을 대변하는 그런 그 빠른 기술 혁신이 오는 이런 상황에서 과연 고령 근로자가 아 직업 현장에서 성과를 어 낼수 있을 것인지 예 그러면 또 어떻게 낼수 있도록 하려면 어떤 교육을 어 기업이나 교육이나 혹은 대학에서 혹은 정부가 아 준비를 할수 있다고 보는지 아마 이 부분은 어 어, 반루 박사께서 해주시면 좋을 것 같고요. 또 박오병 선생님께서 음, 역시 어, 반루 박사님한테 미국을 제외한 선진국에서 인구 감소와 노령화 문제로 어, 추선율 제고를 이제 늘리는 정책을 하고 있지만 또 반대로 어, 지구 전체를 보면 인구 증가가 어, 심각한 문제가 되고 있는 그런 상황입니다. 벌써 70. 억 명을 넘었지 않았습니까? 그래서 이런 모순된 상황에서 어, 유엔에서 이 문제를 다루지 않고 그러셨는데 많이 다루고 있습니다. <웃음> 그렇게 써주셨는데 그래서 어, 개별 국가들의 에, 그 노령화와 저출산 문제가 상충되는데 이건 어떻게 보시는지 이 분을 설명하면 좋겠고요. 어, 또 하나는 아마 뭐그 우리 유장수 교수님이나 조대현 교수님이 설명해 줄수 있을 것 같은데요. 고령화 사회에서 제2인생을 위한 진로 탐색을 하는데 국가가 뭘 해주고 있습니까? 지금 이렇게 물어보셨습니다. 아, 지금 저희가 딱, 딱 10분이에요. 근데 저한테 질문지 주시지 않은 분 중에서 나는 꼭이 말을 해야 되겠다. 아니면 오늘 집에서 잠이 안 온다. 이러신 분은 질문해 주시고 아니 어, 없으시면 제가 지금 마, 방금 질문지를 받아서 한 거를 이 스피커와 디스커턴트한테 돌리도록 하겠습니다. 다른 질문 없으시죠? 그럼 어, 어, 반으로 박사님 답변해 주시죠. 
Thank you very much for the for the interesting questions. Um, turning first to your questions on um, age management is actually a, a, a concept coming up. Um, it's also stimulated by an important network that we had in the last years, which is uh, ESFH, where uh, uh, age management kind of emerged as as an overarching idea that uh, companies uh, use to manage their aging workforces. Um, that's supported by a lot of different tools, uh, because especially uh, if you look at uh, <clears throat> small and medium-sized enterprises, they tend not to always have the capacity to have a large HR department, so they don't have the, the structures in place to do that. So age management is simply the uh, practices that um, manage age just like you manage any other resource. Um, a second question was about the index, and uh, you asked about the, the capacity, right? The capacity. So uh, the capacity um, and the enabling environment for active aging, you, you see things as, um, for instance, educational attainment. You see also social connectedness, um, use of ICT. That's some of the examples that feed into this index. Um, I think that that answers, uh, but I could give you more details on that uh, on that later for sure. No problem. To the questions uh, on the audience, um, with all these changes, how do we ensure? I think that's what I understand from the question. How do we ensure that uh, aging workers perform well in the workplace? Um, Okay, training is of course important, but um, I think more and more we realize that we also need to think the other way around. Uh, we need to look at the skills that people have, because if you look, and I'm just from the top of my head, some of the evidence of our work shows that actually 30% of the jobs in Europe are not using the, uh, the potential of people. So there are underused skills. Uh, Training is, is vital, but we also need to see uh, where can people contribute. And so in some cases, you might need not to adapt the person, but you might need to adapt the job. Um, two other points on that, I think uh, intergenerational learning um, is a very important, um, let's say, mechanism. Uh, to support aging, and I'm not only thinking about, let's say, the, the young wor workers teaching the old, but this also goes the other way around. Uh, older workers have different kind of skills, uh, they have more experience, so they can also uh, uh, help younger workers. Um, already a long time ago there was discussion and research on how to make teams, work teams, age optimal. So having a good distribution of different ages and making sure that you benefit from all ages in the companies. The second was about, question was about the polarization and the increase in population in some parts uh, where it's stronger than others. Um, in Europe the situation, although it's diverse between countries, um, we see uh, that while in some cases population aging, um, it was mentioned yesterday, is not so yet so advanced, for instance in Ireland, mentioned by Mr. Cowan. Uh, in other countries it's much more, more advanced already, like, like in Germany or in Italy. Um, but I think we also need to move beyond the national level because within countries, we see that there are very big differences between regions. Um, my own country, for instance, but um, you saw it in the video as well. In Poland, you have regions where the problem is not that pressing, while in other regions, they are rapidly increasing, aging. So um, I think next to a national approach, uh, we also need to look regionally 
because at the region or even at the level of city, that's where it all happens. So uh, it's very important to keep in mind. We cannot, see, especially large countries, we have to take into account the differences. The last question, if I understand correction, it was about career exploration of older workers. And um, actually, career management skills are one of the, of the key skills of the 21st century. Uh, already mentioned earlier, people will not stay in the same job, so it's important you know how to navigate your career. Um, there are also training plays a role, but also, let's say, the way you design jobs, you, the way you design progression. Um, but at the individual level, for workers, uh, making sure that they have qualifications. Because many people have skills, but they don't have the qualifications to show for them. That's one of the main issues of all the workers. Uh, in Europe, that's the case, and I'm sure that's also the case elsewhere. They have built up the skills by long experience over time, but and they probably will do fine when they stay in their job, but they're limited in terms of progressing because uh, they don't have let's say, the paper to show to a next employer that they actually have the skills. So there's where validation comes in as an important uh, issue. Career exploration is, is important and um, um, one of the key employability skills. Uh, I think uh, to make sure that people have it over a lifetime, it's important to start early on. So already... Uh, Early on, make sure that people have uh, exposure to business, for instance, have uh, get opportunities to develop entrepreneurship, not only in terms of setting up a company, but also developing yourself. So uh, that's also one of the of the EU priorities uh, for vocational education and training to make sure that people have these skills and have this sense of entrepreneurship or what we also sometimes call intrapreneurship which is entrepreneuring yourself did i cover all yeah. more or less all the questions uh, okay. 현재 정부에서 가장 많은 어떤 정책 고객의 대상이 HR 쪽에서 고객이 30대에서 50대입니다. 그러니까 그 정책 건수와 어떤 투자되는 그 비용을 그 다음 숫자가 이제 20대 중후반들을 대상으로 많이 이제 하는 거예요. 근데 상대적으로 지금 우리 루 선생님이 얘기한 어 어떤 고령자에 대한 것은 거의 정책 숫자라든가 그러니까 HR 쪽에서 어 거의 전무할 정도로 낮아요. 우리나라 정부가 그래서 어 지금 우리 고령자를 위한 어떤 HR 정책이 필요하다는 말씀에 에, 우리나라도 사실 귀기울일 필요가 지금 현재 있다라는 생각을 듭니다. 그러니까 어 30대 50대는 지금 뭐 상대적으로 많은 어떤 정책이 에, 펼쳐진 반면 60대 이상의 에, 고령자를 대상으로 해서 거의 에, 관심을 두지 못하고 있다 에, 이런 말씀을 드리고 싶어요. 아 오늘 뭐 시간이 많지 않아서 많은 얘기를 안 했지만. 제가 아까 모두에 말씀드린 것처럼 우리나라는 정말 이게 시급한 과제로 다가왔고요. 정부가 이제 아까 말한 것처럼 기본 계획까지 세워서 하는데 안 되는 여러 가지 중에서 제가 오늘 어, 반루 박사님한테 들은 것 중에 중요한 거는 인식인 것 같아요. 전반적으로 그래서 아까 유럽이 아닌 게 어떤 해, 무슨 해를 정해서 캠페인을 한다 그러는데 저희도 그런 부분을 좀 집중적으로 해야 되지 않을까라는 생각을 많이 했습니다. 이걸 듣는 동안에 우리는 지금 아까도 얘기했지만 30대에서 50대는 많이 하는데 어, 노년층에 대해나 아니면 그러니까 특히 그 50세에서 65세를 저희가 장년층이라고 하는데 이 부분이 상당히 심각해요. 생각보다 고용률은 매우 높은데 그들이 종사하고 있는 그 어, 좌의 퀄리티가 매우 떨어지는 그런 어려움에 봉착해 있습니다. 그래서 미리미리 준비를 어, 해서 어, 이런 스무스하게 넘어갈 수 있도록 그런 부분이 매우 중요하고요. 오늘 반루 박사님께서 그 이후에 뭐 다양한 국가가 있습니다만 저희보다 먼저 고령화를 거쳐간 이후에 
그 고령화에 대한 그런 도전이 어떻게 어, 극복을 하였는가라는 부분에 대한 발표 너무 감사드리고요. 이렇게 또 장시간 앉아서 경청해 주신 그 어디언스에도 감사드립니다. 이것으로 이번 세션을 마치겠습니다. 감사합니다. 감사합니다.